I want to welcome everybody. My name is Holly Register. I'm one of the hosts of this program. And I want to welcome all the veterans that are in the room. Thank you very much for your service. I want to introduce a retired general from the United States Air Force, John Sullivan. He's going to be the MC for the evening. Thank you very much, Howie. Please stand as the Hugo American Legion Color Guard presents the colors and remain standing for the national anthem as the Color Guard withdraws. One, two, three. Present hard. Please honor America as the Klondike Kings from the St. Paul Winter Carnival lead us in our national anthem. Now it's a privilege to introduce the Klondike Cates. Oh, okay. We, uh, we have, an, we have uh, the pipers and the drummers who are going to honor America.
and now the Klondike Cades will sing their military and patriotic songs. And please stand and be recognized when your military branch of the service is acknowledged. The Cates are here and we want to say The Cates are here we want to say We're all proud of the USA We're all proud of the USA It's time to show your military pride It's time to show your military pride Stand up straight, get off your hide Stand up straight, get off your hide Sound off One, two Sound off Three, four One, two, three, four One, two, three, four Thank you for allowing us to be here today to honor our men and women in uniform. We are so happy to do that. We will start off by acknowledging each branch of service, and if you have served in that military service or a family member has, please stand and the rest of the audience, please give them a big shout out and applause. At the end, we'll ask you all to sing God Bless America with us, but we'll, we'll let you know. Here we go. Starting off with a thank you to the United States Navy. Keep on rolling and those caissons will rolling along. And 
Let's hear it one more time for the Klondike Capes from the St. Paul Winter Carnival. This is the 11th anniversary of this uh, event, and the Klondike Capes have been here for every single one. Not only that, they're celebrating a very special year this year. They're celebrating your 50th year of being associated with the St. Paul Winter Carnival. Okay. Well, for the, for the, since the beginning of this uh, gala, this event has been organized by Tom Cucciarella, who is a United States Air Force veteran. Tom uh, was recently diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and he's undergoing a very special treatment, and that's why he's not able to be here today. He's in uh, Nashville, and he's hoping to get back real soon. I, to I know, Tom, they're recording this, and I want to tell you, that we're all pulling for you as you go through uh, this very terrible time. So we wish uh, Tom and, and, and uh, Connie were here, but they're not. I know they're here with us in spirit. Tom should be back fairly soon, and uh, he's gonna be doing a lot of things uh, again for the Wounded Warrior Project. Well, the first 10 years have been a labor of love for Tom and Connie. That's a lot of labor and a lot of love. And Tom has always been here to say thank you. And here are some of the reasons why. And this is really important. Because more than 52,000 servicemen and women have been physically injured in recent military conflicts. Uh, they have been injured in recent military conflicts. An estimated 500,000 of them are living with invisible wounds from depression to post-traumatic stress syndrome. Over 300,000 of them are experiencing brain trauma. The fact that advancements in technology and medicine, they saves many lives. But if we think for a minute, we recognize the quality of the lives those often uh, profoundly alter for the wounded and for their families. These numbers speak for themselves, but not every warrior can. And with the support of the community of donors, our volunteers, team members, and with your presence here, we can give a voice to those needs and help empower our warriors to begin the journey to recovery. Thank you for your presence and support. It's been an impact that you may never personally see, but it occurs every day across Minnesota and the nation because you care. Well, uh, Tom is hoping to get back in time to uh, be a host for the Twin Cities Soldiers Ride um, this, for the fifth time this July. And he, uh, he may be contacting you for some support for that event. Uh, we hope you get well fast, Tom, and you'll be back with us very soon. Well, now it gives me a pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, Mr. Dan Nevin. Dan Nevin's story is one of great personal struggle, but even greater resilience and triumph. Dan joined the United States Army right out of high school and in 2004 was uh, deployed to Iraq as a squad leader. His life changed forever on uh, November 10th of 2004 when an improvised explosive device detonated beneath his uh, vehicle. It resulted in a traumatic brain injury and the amputation of his left leg below the knee. After several years of recurring infections and countless surgeries, Dan chose to surgically remove his right leg as well making him a bilateral amputee. During the first few days of recovery at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, Dan received a backpack from the Wounded Warrior Project, and it contained a lot of comfort items. This created a connection with the Wounded Warrior Project that, uh, that would dramatically impact his personal and his professional life. He since credits Wounded Warrior Project for his successful rehabilitation, his positive attitude, his can-do spirit, and his passion for helping his fellow injur uh, injured warriors. Today, Dan continues to honor the Wounded Warrior Project mission through his passion for yoga as a certified instructor, leading workshops, teacher trainings, and master classes around the country. And we were talking a little bit about golf ahead of time. <laughs> so uh, we're, uh, we, we uh, are kindred spirits in that regard. Uh, Dan is here to share his inspiring story. Please welcome Mr. Dan Niven.
You guys hear me okay? No? How about now? Now? No? I'm gonna have to hold this thing. Better? How about all the way up? Yeah, okay. All right, it's better. Well, I just have to say that it's a complete honor and a privilege to be here. Not very many events make it past a couple years, let alone five, let alone a decade. And now we're in our 11th year for this event. And I have to say, you know, that um, I've heard about, I used to work for, for Wounded Warrior Project inside the organization. It was my job to be over all of the events that happened. And so I remember this event from the very beginning. And so now, over a decade later, to be standing here, no longer working for the organization, but still an ardent supporter, I mean, it just really inspires me to see so many people show up year after year and keep giving and giving and giving and um, to something that's very near and dear to my heart. You know, it's kind of funny. We talked about the 11th you know, annual event, and 11 is a pretty significant number. So, Veterans Day, 11-11. And from the reaction to the Marine Corps hymn, 11-10, also a big, pretty big deal. Marines, where are you at? <laughs> All right, that, always barking. For those of you who don't know, that's, that's the deal. Well, like the Marine Corps birthday happens to be a pretty significant day for me as well. Yeah, yeah go Marine. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that Marine Corps birthday, 18 years ago, November 10th, 2004, changed my life forever, and I'll, I'll never forget the day. I was taking my team out for a 72-hour dismounted counterinsurgent operation in Balad, Iraq. And if you remember your history, the Battle of Fallujah had just started on November 7th of 2004. And so I, that was a Marine Corps effort, and I wasn't a Marine, but I remember that day specifically because for those of you who don't know a lot about the Marine Corps, there's one thing that they don't have that the Army does, and that's medics. So they use Navy corpsmen, and those Navy corpsmen that work with the Marines are a very special breed, but there's not a lot of them. And so on November 7th, when the Battle of Fallujah started, they really needed medics. And I happened to have the best medic known to man. His name was Sergeant Coutreau. And Sergeant Coutreau, if you knew him, and I saw a lot of military people stand up, so you'll kind of get this. Sergeant Coutreau was the guy that was like not the best soldier in garrison, but when in combat, shine. You know, and so like this is, I'll, I'll give you an example. So Sergeant Coutreau, in the military, there's such a thing as noise discipline and light discipline. You've heard of that before, military folks? That means, for those of you who don't understand that, that means like when it's really dark outside and you're trying to be quiet, like you don't want to shine a, a flashlight because then the enemy knows where to put the bullets. Same thing if it's like you're trying to be quiet, you're making a loud noise, and then the enemy knows where to put the bullets. So you don't do those things. Well, Sergeant Coutreau was the type that on a, like a 2 a.m., now granted, threat level pretty low, sort of overwatch patrol, he was the guy that would pop out of the truck and just light a cigarette. <laughs> Big cherry just glowing like bright as, bright as daytime in the middle of the night. And just be like, man, I hate it here. Oh my God, my wife's at home doing God knows what. This is just going on and on and on about all the things he didn't like about what we were doing. And, you know, so no noise discipline, no light discipline. But when things got real, Sergeant G could shoot, move, communicate, keep us patched up and in the fight. No one was better than him. So when the Marines needed medics, I wasn't surprised that they took him. And I wound up with this new medic, a guy named Dan Smee. And Dan Smee, see, I was deployed. I did eight years active duty after high school, all peace. I joined a fight in the Gulf War. I'm, I'm dating myself, but that's fine. I'm in good company, but dating ourselves. And then I, I just remember like eight years of peacetime army, because if you remember the history, in 1991 when I enlisted, that war started in February of 1991. It was over in March of 1991. And I didn't graduate high school till June. And then so eight years of peacetime army, got out, but stayed in the National Guard. So like the rest of my military career was serving in the National Guard. And so the National Guard is not, uh, my last primary duty station was Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Anybody been there? Hoorah. There we go. Yeah, like if you, are, if you want to call yourself a soldier, you're from Fort Bragg, North Carolina. <laughs> Feeding these together, home of the airborne, special, special operations command, like all these things. Uh, like our, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. You know, you look up, you know, 
soldier in the dictionary, you see a guy standing there like Fabio with a short haircut and his weapon system, like looking all jacked, like that was for Bragg. But the California Army National Guard was not that. It was a little bit like Flabio, but that's a different, <laughs> no judgment. It just was different from, you know, four hour recall to anywhere in the world to one weekend a month, kind of barely hanging on with any budget. It was a big deal. And so Dan Smee was from the California National Guard as well. And I gotta tell you, when we went to combat, we weren't ready. We weren't prepared. We were undertrained, underfunded, the whole thing. If you remember how the media circus showed up, like we didn't have the proper armor, armor back at the time. I remember recalling some memories here from the news highlights. And we had trucks that didn't have armor. Our body armor didn't match. The, we were missing all this equipment. But we still got it done anyway. And we learned some really tough lessons. And we started losing people. And then those lessons became viscerally real. And so when we weren't doing five to seven combat operations every single day, we were training because the consequence of not being prepared was too high. And then I'll never forget, so when we mobilized for, for right after Fallujah, two days later we got some intelligence that some of the enemies from Fallujah were leaving to come attack our area of operations, a place called LSA Anaconda in Balad, Iraq. And LSA Anaconda was very large, like 20,000 people there, all these multinational forces, DOD civilians. I mean, they had pools there. As an infantry guy, I got to just drive past the pools while people were like hanging out and doing their thing, all the civilians kind of hanging out. But I tell you what, the threat was real. I mean, they were tired of getting their butts whooped by the Marines, I guess, in Fallujah, so they decided to take a break and come try to attack us. So we drew up this battle plan, 72 hour dismount counterinsurgent operation. We were gonna take the fight to them. Like that's what we were gonna do. And we've been successful in missions like that in the past, so this wasn't gonna be any different. And so I'll never forget the gravity of this mission was like extra high for me because I was the first squad leader of 3rd platoon. The non-commissioned officer in charge for this operation should have been my platoon sergeant, a guy named Sergeant First Class Mike Adelini. And if Mike were in this room right now, he would not be like the talkative guy in the room. He definitely wouldn't be the smartest guy in the room. He wouldn't be the most charismatic guy in the room. He didn't like events like he probably wouldn't be in this room. He's kind of like a loner. But Sergeant First Class Mike Adelini was the hardest working human being I've ever met in my life. I saw the man wince one time, once. Well, we all did. He was getting out of his vehicle and he winced. We're like, hey, what's going on? And he just reluctantly pulled up his shirt and showed us this two inch protruding abdominal hernia that looked really gnarly coming out of his belly. And we were like, sorry, you gotta get that fixed. Like, and he was like, yeah, he kind of like owned up to like he did have to. So he was scheduled for surgery two weeks out to go to Longshore Regional Medical Center. And then so I took over the platoon. And so this was the first big mission with when I was in charge. And so we prepared, we trained, we practiced, rehearsed for every possible contingency, and I'll never forget leaving the morning of November 10th, 2004. I did all my pre-combat checks with all my guys with a six vehicle convoy, my medic, Dan Smee, and like Dan Smee, like I said, he was from the California Army National Guard like us, but he didn't serve with us. He didn't get the benefit of all this training that we had, like putting himself in harm's way. He was like serving in the rear. He never really went outside the wire. And I never forget meeting Dan Smee for the first time. He had his helmet kicked back on his head and he had this blonde hair just hanging down in his face. <laughs> this guy. And he, I just remember he was like, hey, Sergeant Evans, oh my God, it's so good to meet you, bro. I was like, are you high? What's happening? Like, what is, it? Like, what is this? This is not what I'm used to, right? Um, but he seemed to be good. We went on a few smaller missions together before this day. He seemed to be a great guy but I knew nothing about his ability to save lives. And then I remember, so we did the pre-combat checks. Dan Smee was in the last vehicle. I went up, did, did the high, give a high five when you're good to go for me. Like you get a high five to so say you have all your bullets, enough food, every, your water, everything you, you need. And I get to my first vehicle. I'm in the lead vehicle and I go to tap my driver. My driver's name's Smitty. I go to tap Smitty and it turns around. It's not Smitty, it's Mike, my boss. I was like, Mike, what are you doing here? And he did that thing that people do when they're about to tell you something they shouldn't have done. He pulled me over to the side and whispered, hey, so uh, I went and found Smitty this morning and uh, I told him he was sick. 
And if he didn't agree, that I was going to make him real sick. So, <laughs> Smitty was sick this morning, and we needed a driver, so I volunteered. And for those of you who don't know, platoon sergeants don't drive vehicles. It's just not in their purview. It's not what they do. That's for like the younger guys. But I remember he hopped in the driver's seat, and we left the main gates of LSA and Anaconda at exactly 0, 0400 hours, right on time, military precision. And I just remember we went through the Hesco barriers in the main gate. We took a right on a well-paved road that was pretty well-traveled that we called Route Dover. And then an almost immediate left on a not so well traveled dirt road and route to what was supposed to be our dismount site, maybe three or three and a half kilometers down this road with one turn. And I remember it was pitch black outside. Low hanging cloud cover, so you couldn't see the moon or stars. Again, it's four o'clock in the morning. And as we're bouncing down this pitiful road in complete silence and darkness, I mean, it was so silent. I don't remember hearing anything but the familiar 6.2 liter Cummings diesel engine in my Humvee as we moved carefully down this pitiful stretch of road. And I remember my head was bowed in prayer like it was before every mission. And as we're carefully moving down this road, boom! The silence was destroyed by the deafening blast that set my 18,000 pound up armored Humvee about six feet in the air in a ball of fire. I remember being in that prayer, and when the explosion happened, I could feel and hear the truck basically disintegrate around my body. And I don't really remember much, but I remember the explosion happening, and I could, I could feel and hear the truck basically disintegrate around me, and, and not really just being unfamiliar with the noise. And I might have been knocked out for a couple seconds, but I'm not really sure, but I knew it wasn't long, because when I opened my eyes, I realized that I was ejected from the vehicle and my legs remained caught in the twisted and burning metal that used to be the floorboard and undercarriage of the truck. And I was trying to make sense of things. I just tasted blood in my mouth. My face felt really hot. I had a sickening knot in my stomach, and my ears were just ringing, so I really couldn't hear much. But as I sat back, I just remember listening to my team move with tactical proficiency, securing the perimeter doing everything that they're supposed to be doing. And I'm supposed to be the guy yelling out commands and doing the things, but I was saying nothing, and they were doing everything right. And I just remember, as the dust started to descend, I, I could see a little more clearly now because some of the lingering fire from the blast started to engulf my vehicle. And that provided some light. And in that light, I looked forward to the driver's compartment of the vehicle, and I noticed immediately it was painfully obvious that starting first class, Mike Adelini had made the ultimate sacrifice. And it's actually who I wear this bracelet for every day. And I know in this room, you're probably familiar with this bracelet. It's a memorial bracelet that we wear to honor the people who don't get to come home. And yes, I've worn this every day for the last 18 years. This is like my 20th one. They're not very durable. But, um, I do wear this as a memorial for Mike, but I also wear it as a reminder for two really important things. And the first thing is it reminds me to work hard. Because Mike was the hardest working human being I ever met. And like we all, like we all talk about goals. And I know for me, I was one of the people who would talk a big game, like what I wanted to do with my life or some goal that I had, but then not really do the work and then be surprised why it didn't happen in the time frame that I wanted. So this reminds me that if there's something I want in my life and something I want to achieve or something I want to do, like Tom and Connie starting this event, that I better be willing to do all the work necessary to make it happen. So this bracelet helps me stay focused, stay on track, and also helps me say no to the things that I know I'm not going to show up 100% for. And the second thing this reminds me to do is live not just be alive. You know, to live as the, a lot of these, I see this on the social media now, talk, people talk about being the main character of their life. It's kind of like a thing that the young kids talk about. And I'm like, nah, bump that. I don't want to be the main character. I want to be the author of my life. To like know who it is I want to be and to make the decisions every day when I wake up until I go to bed, make the decisions that are in alignment with who it is I want to be as a man, as a leader, as a peer, as a son, and as a dad to three amazing girls and one amazing granddaughter. Like this bracelet helps me like, it's like my North Star. But when I saw Mike, 
and I knew he was gone, I knew that I was probably hurt worse than I thought. So like we're trained, I started with my head and my helmet came apart in two pieces in my hand and then that's not a great start, but I was conscious and that's really good. And then I remembered like everything in the government, that helmet was made by the lowest bidder. So <laughs> could have just been a defect. I remember checking myself, my arms, my, and I could start to get feeling back in my fingers now, my arms, my torso, and when I reached up for my legs, that's when I felt it. The unmistakable arterial blood spurt with every beat of my heart, and I knew that I was going to die. I started to make my peace with God. I was saying goodbye to my wife and my 10-year-old daughter. I was giving up. And losing what seemed like all of my blood in this miserable place on the planet. And you know how they say when you're about to die, your life flashes before your eyes. You've probably heard that before, yeah? Well, that wasn't my experience. For, for me, it was more like watching a slideshow all, of all the things left undone. It's like one at a time, these sort of images were coming up, and I was saying goodbye or letting go of it. And I really can't remember what those were, but I remember the last one. It was my 10-year-old girl, all dressed up in white, head to toe, and walking down the aisle without her dad. And I just shot up. I was like, Dan, I'm alive. I'm alive. I have to do something to keep it that way. So I reached my hand in the wound in my thigh, almost up to my wrist. Like I thought I was going to be like MacGyver and just find the artery and pinch it off. And like I got to <laughs> rub some dirt on it. You know, that's what I like, literally thought that. And that's just not how it went down. I just pressed against the piece of shrapnel that was still lodged in my femur, and I prayed that it would give me enough time for the medic to arrive, because Sergeant G could fix anything. And it's like I blinked my eyes, and no Sergeant G. Here was Dan Smee with his hair <laughs> just hanging in my face, <laughs> lying to me straight out of his mouth. Sergeant Evans, you're going to be all right. I blinked again, there was a tourniquet on my leg. I blinked again, and there was my team leader, Sergeant Chillis, putting an IV in my arm. And I blinked again, and my whole team, my military family, was right there putting themselves in harm's way to remove my legs from that vehicle that was still on fire. And it's like I blinked again, I was on a stretcher, then into the combat surgical hospital that was right next to the main gates of LSA and Anaconda that I just left maybe 10 minutes before. And I just remember the happy juice going in my IV and my next memory was waking up in the recovery room, or it was a tent, a recovery tent section. And there was a combat nurse's face right in mine, and I'll never know her name, but I'll never forget her face or what she said to me. She said, Sergeant Evans, you're a very lucky man. We managed to repair your femoral artery, and we had to take your left leg below the knee we managed to save your right one for now, but you'll probably lose that one too. And she was right. And right about the time that pity party started to sink in, like what can a guy with no legs do? Is, you know, I was married to this beautiful woman and we were both competitive runners and like, how am I gonna run again? Like, would my wife still love me anymore? The answer to me at that moment was no. And then my daughter, I used to throw her on my shoulders and run around and play hard with her like dads do with their kids and like, how could I, do that, would she still look up to me the same way? Like, what if I was in a wheelchair? And I had all these questions, this pity party soaking in, but then I looked up against the wall of the tent, and there was my whole team just waiting for me to wake up. And they all surrounded my bed, and we told horribly inappropriate jokes. <laughs> it was so bad. They were so bad. I cannot, I cannot re re I, gratefully, I can't recall all of them, but I just remember, I was like, that's even bad for me. Like, I was, and I was on some really good pain medicine, so they're extra funny. <laughs> and I just remember, like, going to sleep and waking up the next day in Lounge Regional Medical Center in Germany, where I'd spend the next seven days with surgery, probably twice a day, waking up in a pool of my own blood, waiting for a dressing change. And that's not a knock on the hospital staff at Lounge because they're incredible. Because that was, hospital was completely full. Every ward was full. The hallways were full of combat wounded, mostly Marines. Most of them worse off than I was. And most of them 18 and 19 years old. 
I'll never forget those moments when I was awake enough to kind of witness the miracles that were happening in that hospital. And then I finally got my trip to Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And I remember I had my welcome to Walter Reed surgery, which was one of the most painful experiences of my life. And I just remember that first day on Ward 57, and I met my nurse, Erica, who was smoking hot, by the way, smoking hot nurse Erica. I think I proposed to her three times. <laughs> She's like, you're married. I'm like, shh. <laughs> I mean, she was like, you know, scale of one to 10, she was on 11. But probably because she had pain medicine. So like, I don't care what she looked like. She was an 11 all day. She was like literally an angel. But she was the only, she was the first human being in over a week that I got to talk to, like really talk to. And I just remember I was pushing my food around on my plate. My wife was on her way from California and I was really not looking forward to that because of all the things I said earlier, like how would she receive me? That was a huge question mark and I didn't want to deal with. But then she said, there's some people in the hallway that I think you should meet. And I said, if you say I should meet them, then I want to meet them. And in came two of the founders of Wounded Warrior Project with a backpack, with this logo on it, one warrior carrying another off the battlefield. And I instantly identified with it because I was just the guy on top of that logo being carried off the battlefield. And then the words Wounded Warrior Project, which I had never heard of before that day. And I just remember opening this and sort of rifling through it, it became the most significant gift I've ever received. Notes from grateful Americans saying thank you for your service and your sacrifice. A CD player and CDs, that's the best they could do 18 years ago. <laughs> a deck of playing cards, shorts and a t-shirt, something that I could put on and feel like a human being again. There were socks. I didn't really need the socks, but they were in there. <laughs> they made really great hand puppets for the, for the narcotics that I was on. Oh, I entertained myself in my room. <coughs> two years I stayed at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. There were over like 32 different surgeries while I was there. I just finished surgery number 37. Uh, they keep going, by the way. Um, and this whole time, Wounded Warrior Project has been there for me every single step of the way. Like I said, I used to work for the organization and now I just speak when they ask me to because I love them so much. The founders who are not even actually very involved anymore. To the people. The people that make up the day-to-day -day operations of Wounded Warrior Project, the best and brightest our country has to offer, who could be or do anything and make all the money they want and yet they choose to work for a nonprofit and make a difference to something that means something to them. And I'm so grateful to stand up here today just to say thank you. Less than a week ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I know, oh, I'm gonna be fine. I just know it. But they wanted to do surgery sort of right away. It's kind of a big deal. And I asked for a, a few different reasons, but one of the reasons I asked to postpone it is because I wanted the opportunity to come here and say thank you. It's a big deal what you've done the last 11 years. I hope you know it. Whether you're bidding on a silent auction item or, or whether you're the registers, like doing what you do, stepping in to fill huge shoes, all the hosts for what you do year after year to like do something that's bigger than yourself for people who really need it. Because I'm telling you the need, like the wars may not be going on right now, and God, I hope there's no more armed conflict for our country. And though the, the wounds, the invisible wounds, have just begun to multiply because people would self-medicate with redeployment. Self-medicate with drugs, self-medicate with alcohol, and self-medicate because being deployed is so much easier than being at home. It's simple. Keep you, keep you and your buddies alive. Eat, sleep, and all the other things that you know where that goes. And then you come home, and it's a tough transition, and you're trying to like leave the military, and you have to, especially if you're wounded, and try to translate your military skills into civilian, you don't feel, you feel like a square peg in a round hole. And sometimes that doesn't get better. So the way to combat that is to go fight again. And now those opportunities are gone. 
And I don't say that, I mean, that's a great thing, but the need is surging. So I hope to be here year 12 and year 22 and beyond because we need you. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you. I went way longer than I was supposed to. But I have cancer, so I can do whatever I want. <laughs> thank you. Dan back uh, to the stage. Do you want to come back now? Yes. Okay. Wait, what am I doing? <laughs> well, I, I do want to say um, that someone dropped a black Samsung phone somewhere. I have it on my table. If you're missing a black Samsung phone, that's not what I came back up for. I just want to, I do want to say this. Um, I know I'm going to be called back up to do some awards yes. later, but I want to say this one thing. It's not every day that a staff sergeant gets to be introduced by a general, so I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> right. One of the facts of life about being a general is I got to be a general because I always listened to my sergeants. <laughs> Dan, thanks a lot for being here. That was an incredibly inspiring and compelling presentation. Thank you for sharing this day with us. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, it's time for the Quilts of Honor, or Quilts of Valor. We have to announce them. We, I, yes, we're going to announce the uh, winners. We have 10 winners here today. And uh, as your, if your name is called, would you please come up onto the stage and we will present you with one of our quilts. We're very fortunate to uh, be able to again uh, award the Quilts of Valor this year. Just a, a brief background. The Blue Star mom, Catherine Roberts, began the Quilts of Valor Foundation from her sewing room in her home in Seaford, Delaware. Her son Nathaniel's uh, year-long deployment to Iraq provided the inspiration for her. But her desire to see that uh, returning warriors were honored was uh, one of the most compelling things that uh, moved her to begin this foundation. How much of an impact has the Quilts of Valor Foundation had over the years? As of February 28th of this year, there have been over 298,000 quilts awarded to US service members and veterans across the country. That's an average of about 450 quilts a week. Well, so tonight we will award quilts to uh, 10 of our veterans from all branches of the military, those who serve currently, and to those who have served in the past. When your name is called, please come up to the stage and we'll present the quilts for you. The first person is Aaron Harrell. recipients to stay here so we can honor them after the entire presentation. The second person is Carrie Allison. Carrie? The third recipient is Robert Ditto. Thank you. 
The next recipient, Veronica Wayne. Our next recipient, Bob Nealon. And now we honor Hissa Lindsay. Our next recipient, Gary Taft. <laughs> I didn't think we had two people named Gary Taft here. <laughs> And now, Blair Curtis. And now Bob Clority, Sr. Bob is a veteran of uh, Vietnam and is a recipient of the Purple Heart. <laughs> the last recipient is our amazing guest speaker, Dan Nevins. Certificates for you all over here too. If you just come this way. If you can come over here, 
uh, the, the ladies who made these quilts for you will package them up so you can take them home. Before we go to dinner, how about a nice round of applause for the Klondike Cakes, Dan Evans, Tom and Connie Cucciarella, and the Quilters who have donated so much time, talent, and materials for the Quilts of Honor. All of our partners, our volunteers, our Wounded Warrior Project staff, and the spirit behind all these efforts, Tom Cucciarella. I'd also like to thank uh, Howie and uh, Jackie Register for all the work they've done this year. They stepped up. They stepped up and volunteered when we needed somebody to do it. Thank you, thank you very much. I'd also like to thank the uh, 2009 and 2022 Vulcan crews. They uh, provide a lot of the impetus behind this. They have been uh, working with the Wounded Warrior Project ever since 2009 when they chose Wounded Warrior Project as their supportable charity uh, for this year. They've been great and they provide a lot of the administrative assistance and help that we get throughout the year. coming to a close, but first I'd like to uh, once again thank uh, 
thank Holly Register and Jackie for all they've done. Thank you, Ken, for being here with us today. And I'd like you all to stand, please. Please stand for the solemn playing of taps. And this is going to be done by Henry Lowe of the Osseo Maple Grove uh, American Legion Post. Thank you, Henry, as we remember and honor our fallen brothers and sisters. Well, this has been a fun night, everybody. Uh, we look forward to next year and the 12th anniversary and to having Tom and Connie back with us again. So thanks, have a good evening, and we stand adjourned. <laughs>